verse, it says something like, For we know that all things work together for good. Amen? Amen. To them who love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Amen. Amen. A question I would like to ask, is there anything more discouraging than to work really, really hard for something? Giving your best only to realize in the end that it, all your efforts, all the things that you put in were in vain. The question is, is there anything more discussed? Have you ever felt like that before? And I was thinking, I'm kind of trying to re remember, even though I might look young, not as young as I look, first of all. Everybody's supposed to say amen. Amen. But um, I remember getting an assignment or being at school, I don't know if anybody's ever done, being at school or college or university, receiving an assignment or something to do, and you know, you really think to yourself, listen, I want an A for this. I want an A, maybe a B, but an A is really what I'm aiming for. Right? You put all the work in, and you, 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 you get, look at all the, bring all the, uh, the information from different places, and you really put it out lovely, and you kind of set it out well, and you think, yes, my tutor, or my professor, or my teacher is gonna, and you kind of even wanna boast among your friends, like to say, listen man, there's a lot of work on this, you know. Mm -hmm. You feel good. Anybody done that before? And then when you get your paper, when you hand it in and you get your paper back, you see something like an F on it. And you're thinking, what? What's going on? And you kind of like start to think to yourself, maybe you know, you're the pupil and you have the teacher or the professor. And you, you almost want to argue, as it were, how dare he or she give me an F? Listen, I got this stuff from a valuable source. I looked it up in a dictionary. I looked it up on numerous, book, numerous books and just checked out. So I got this. And he didn't even give me a, not even a B or a C, he gave me an F. And as you begin to, you know, you're vexing. Before you was telling everybody about how your assignment, you know, yeah, this is my assignment. People say, what do you think? Nah, 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 I'll nah, show you this. Because you know people like to do copy and edit. So he said, I'll tell you later. Then when you get it, one of a sudden, that kind of boastfulness kind of like, you go into your show a little bit because you don't want to know. You know, in, in, in class, people say, what did you get? What did you get? And say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Try to kind of style it off. But when you look at the paper properly, you see also the teacher's right in red, or whatever it is, and it's, it's got an F, and then it says, uh, great scholarship, great detail. You know, it's kind of getting you mad now, because if there's great scholarship, great details, why did I get F? Excellent effort. But you answered the wrong question. <laughs> All that work addressing the wrong thing. The wrong assignment. You just didn't understand the question, what the teacher said. Remember, depending on what kind of people you are, you will also want to go to the head to say, well, look, sir or ma'am, I did all this work, I've got this because I've learned from the library, some of the stuff, and I put it in, I put the name down so it's not perfect, you know, like, like I did it myself. But then you realize you answered the wrong question. So you did a lot of work, a lot of things, there nothing wrong with all your work, but you did a lot of things, but the wrong assignment, the wrong purpose. And so your problem isn't so much that you didn't work hard, because you did work hard. It's not that you wasn't sincere, you did work very sincere and took time in your writing. But the reason that 
take stuff out of the scripture. Distract, extract out of the scripture. So, God is going to work all things for good only as those things fit with his purpose. <laughs> You're welcome, man. So, when I reevaluate things, I have to look and see when things in my life are going or coming together or working out for good. I have to ask my friend the question, could the reason be that I haven't yet connected my life with his purpose? Is it that I may be trying to, still trying to get everything to work together for the good of my purpose? So then, if that's the case, I have to ask another question. What is, oh God, somebody's preaching with me. What is God's purpose? For me, what is your purpose for you? What is your purpose for us? How many people believe that we have a loving God? Hallelujah. And because he's such a loving God, God hasn't left us to guess the answer. He hasn't left us to guess the answers on our own because if we guess the answer, we will all come up with different things. Let me just plug this. That's why it's important to come to Sunday school. When you come to Sunday school, you begin to learn some stuff that you may never have learned before. And also be able to ask some questions which you'll be able to answer. But if we look in the very next verse of the great New Testament passage, he clearly states his purpose for you and me. He says, for those who he foreknew, he also predestined oh God, to become Hallelujah. conformed to the image of his son. Hallelujah. So that he would be the first, firstborn, the firstborn among many brethren. Oh, 
but he wants to make the whole, a whole community of people to look like, just like his son. So that when people see me and you, they get a glimpse of Jesus. Some people say that, I've never seen Jesus. They say, yeah, you see Jesus, is in me? You mean you haven't seen Jesus? Oh, God. In fact, the father is so high on his son that he wanted to give him something. What can I give my son to let him know how much I love him? You know, I just, I just give him a whole entire race, a company of redeemed citizens. So if you're saved, you're a gift from the father to the son. Let me, let me, let me go on to say this. Listen, many people may come to my house. Or may have been to my house, or may have even seen pictures. And, and, and may see a picture, I've got a big son, and if I see a picture of my big son, not Aaron, uh, my big son, my bigger son. And when they see him, they might think, wow, you guys will pass the streets, or you guys really look alike. And the question is, why do we look so much alike? Because of a DNA connection. What's happening to my has been transferred to my son. And in the process of this development, of his development, he ends up looking like me. What a blessed son. <laughs> and in the living body of Jesus Christ, we see human beings who perfectly contains all the DNA of deity over and over again. And so the Bible assures us of this. Jesus is the exact representation of God's nature. In him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Therefore Jesus is the image of God. The image of the invisible God. And now God wants to transfer that same divine DNA to a group or a class which are called Christians. The redeemed community of saints. The elect of God who are adopted into this wonderful family. They are the men and the women and boys and girls who have committed to God's Son, Jesus Christ. And His divine DNA transferred is accomplished in them when they come to faith in Christ as their Savior. That's why the Apostle Peter tells us that through though, no, through God's promises, we may become partakers of the divine nature. So that's my purpose for you, God is telling us. And that's my only purpose. And to accomplish this purpose, I'm going to take all the pieces of your life, the good, the bad, the ugly, and I'm going to orchestrate them together for good, for your maximum benefits and your abundant life. Our problem, and the reason so many of us as believers stay defeated, for so long is that we fail to grasp this purpose. And it seems as though because we fail to grasp the purpose, we are working on the wrong assignment. We're writing the wrong paper. Because unless the priority of our life, unless the priority of your life and my life is Christ likeness. Then we won't be able to recognize God working all things out. You won't be able to see it. And that's the great tragedy. Because by coming to faith in the Lord Jesus as your sin bearer, and by launching 
in the cosmic relationship with, and it has some staggering implications. In fact, if we go to John chapter 17, we, we there we get a glimpse of it. It was known as the high priest in prayer of Jesus. He prayed these words to his father on the night before he died on the cross. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. And again, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. You see, Jesus was essentially saying this, Father, make me look good so I can make you look good and grow and as well as make others look good. You see, this, this glory extends to you and to me as well. Jesus prayed for his followers, all of us, and spoke these words, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them. John 17, 22. And he prayed this, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. See, Jesus has included us in this looking good factor. You see, the Father and the Son were having so much fun, they wanted to share it. They wanted a company of redeemed humanity who would get in on all of this. What's happened is that we've actually been hooked up into the reality of the Father and the Son, making each other look good, and Jesus makes it clear that he wants us to be a part of it. And the, the, the Father is consumed with the Son, and the Son is consumed with the Father, and together they want us to pass in on that. And they want us to have an interpersonal immersion relationship. But then I go on to say it's all something bigger than you and all, you and I. It's bigger than whatever we could imagine. And so it, it turned on implications connected to it. But here is the problem. If all of this doesn't match our own priority, then we won't be hanging with the Father and the Son the way that we intended us to. Could I want to say this? God's purpose for you and for me is Christ-likeness, which means being conformed to the character of Christ. It's having, God, it's having God's value. You see, when we're Christ-like, it means that we have having God's values and God's conduct expressed in our humanity through the uniqueness of our personality. Christ-likeness simply means emulating who Christ is. Not because you're stressing and straining, but because Christ is in you. Uh-oh. So could I go on to say that Christ his purpose for us is not for us to have a great job or your health, perfect health. His purpose for you is not necessarily to have a wonderful family. Uh -oh. Those are benefits and they're good benefits and it's fine. And I'm not saying it's not fine to want a good job or to have a nice family. That's okay, that's fine. But none of those happen to be his major objective for you. Or for me, God's purpose is not even for us to be happy or happy. No, God's purpose is not even for us happiness. So you say, well, Pastor, are you suggesting that God wants us to be unhappy? No, 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 that's not what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that happiness is not his prevailing goal for you. Conforming to his son is what he's really after. The Bible says, well, you say, well, Pastor, this is not kind of science is right. But let me give you an example. In Matthew 26, around the 39th verse, in, in the garden of Gethsemane, on the night when Jesus was betrayed, Jesus said to his father,
father. My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. It was like Jesus was saying, this cup of suffering is an unhappy position.
love the way you have. When we look for you, what Jesus wants us to Jesus wants to just represent him. Just be, be me. Be me. Let me, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. If we're all, uh, if this young man wanted to be, or if I need to call myself, this uh, the way I want to get in If I want to be like Michael Jordan, I, I really want to be like Michael Jordan. And one, although many of you might not believe me, I'm too old now. I'm not six foot. I love you. I can't do the skills, and even if I want to read all these books, and I read these books, and I study these books, and I know these books, I've got how I drive, and try to be, I still not like Michael Jordan. And what happened is that because I lack the capacity, oh God, I lack the capacity to be like Michael Jordan, no matter how much books I read. Not tall enough, maybe well, maybe too much weight. <laughs> How about a skill factor? None of this changes the fact that I simply don't have the capacity to do what he did. And the harder I try to play on his level, the more I will get end up frustrated and discouraged. That's the same thing what's happening with us. The more we're trying to be, like, listen, we are. We got it. Likewise, there are lots of Christians who are frustrated and discouraged because they seem to be put, you know, it's like they just can't put off this abundant life promise that Jesus is talking about. And it seems that we can't uh, be like more like Jesus, be like Jesus. No matter how we try, we read all the fundamental books and God. We try to put them in practice, but somehow it's still not working. It might work for one week or two. But let me just say this. The truth of the matter is that there isn't one man or woman who ever lived with the ability to be just like Jesus. There's a lot of frustrated and discouraged Christians today who have tried. They're reading their Bibles, but still, they're addicted. They're praying every day, but they can't shake off the sinful attitude or behavior. They're even trying to share their faith with others, but still nobody's coming to Christ. Why are so many of us believers living in defeat when Jesus promised us victory? I believe that Paul, the apostle, gives a, a little hint in Romans chapter 8, verses 10. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead, because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. You see, we've got a capacity problem. That's the problem. And the capacity problem is this we live in a mortal physical body that are dead because of sin. Therefore, we are no more able to be like Jesus than I am able to be like Michael Jordan. So the truth of the matter is this, no matter how many New Year's resolutions that you make, no matter how many promises or vows that we utter, because we just don't have the capacity within us to do it. Sure, many of us may have the ability to do be good people, and many of us have a good time, good days, good weeks. But let me just rush on. The reality is this, we're still only corpse. Because sin has killed our ability to be what God wants us to be. And then it sounds like it's an impossible situation. Possibly, what's the what was the word if we can't be like Jesus then? Even though God said that we must be conformed to his image of his son, none of us have the capacity to do that. But our God loves work. He's able to do a good thing about it. We don't. We don't have the capacity. That's what I'm saying. We don't have the capacity. But my God loves to work with the impossible. Uh oh. You see people thinking, what the pastor say? God works with the impossible. And God has made a way for you and for me to become more and more like Jesus every day you walk with him. To be honest, for me to be like Michael Jordan at this point, Michael Jordan would have to come into me. If it was 
was possible for him to come into me and then I'll be able to do all the skills that he does. But it's not possible. You, you, you understand me? Are, 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 you, are you getting me? Too many of us take a backward approach when it comes to Christ like this. We try to fix ourselves spiritually by doing the things we believe will make us better Christians. But that means we're trying to fix the problem with <laughs> what is the problem in the first place. You can't fix the problem with the problem because you continually get a problem. Uh -oh. I think it's too, it's, it's, it's too, too much for some of you see, if you have a house that is destroyed by fire and then you try to rebuild back the house with the ashes and the charred remains, it's a case of something completely dead trying to raise itself back to life. And I, you know, I'm not a medical expert, but I have no confidence that there's been ever a case of someone actually Or herself back to life. I'm talking about dead, dead, dead. Once they died, they stayed that way. No matter how much that person might have wanted to go on living. And so the truth of this, we have a virus of sin has infected the body that you cannot help. You cannot help you. The body is dead. That's why the Apostle Paul said, the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. Hallelujah, you see what I'm saying? And he cries out, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? But, it's, but Paul is like us when he cried, I want to do right, but I can't. I want to get off drugs or alcohol. Sit down. 
momentum is this. Yeah. 